Hey there guys, Templar here, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about the Celts of Britannia. Now, a lot of you guys might actually ask yourselves, what are the Celts of Britannia? Well, the Celts of Britannia are a type of group that are pretty much the most forgotten people, well, somewhat, I guess you might say, but technically they're both their downfall and how they were actually conquered are pretty much lost to history. The only thing we remember about the Celtic Britannians was pretty much the Iceni Uprising led by Boudicca. Yeah. Anyways. Now, this actually uh, came to me from a viewer reply, and it is none other than uh, Sarma, Sar, Sarma, mm, Sarmana? Uh, excuse me if that's uh, Miss um, Experience Unctuated. Uh, Anyways, they actually are asking what actually happened to the Celts of I of, well, of Britain. Well, that's actually quite very well impressive for great for them to ask that, because I was actually going to be actually doing one of these on a couple of newer episodes, but pretty much I thought, well, might as well start this one now. Now, we guys might wonder what did the Celts of Britannia use as arms and armor? Well, let's first start off with their arms, preferably in the Bronze Age. Now, they always had the same type of Bronze Age weaponry. Thing is, though, their arms and armor were a little different compared to their, uh, well, to their relatives in the, uh, mainland Europe. Because technically, they were almost like the same as the Gauls, except they were not. It's complicated there. Uh, but yeah. Now, the Celts of, Mo of Britannia didn't use heavy armor. In fact, hardly any of them used chainmail, and hardly any of them used bronze armor. In fact, the only type of form of metal armor they would have used would actually be a rarity of chainmail, and a few times they would only use a couple of helmets. In fact, the Celts of Britannia would pretty much actually run out bare butt naked. Yeah, I know, this sounds a little weird coming from a guy who talks about history in this, but the thing is, uh, pretty much at this point in time, we don't know what the Celts of Britannia use at armor. But there is a wide variety of arms and armor that the Celts of Britannia might have used. That was non-metallic. Now you guys might ask ourselves, wait, non-metallic? Really? That can work? Actually, it can. Bronze Age arms and armor can pretty much actually be seen in history as light type combat armor. In fact, non-metallic armor was one of those exceptions. And pretty much we could see why. It was lighter, it would pretty much still protect it the same way. The only difference is it'd be made out of, well, fabric instead of metal. Now, the Celts of Britannia would have used a type of t light vest that would have actually been decorated with, uh, I guess you might say, riveted buds on the, t on the, uh, design on it, pretty much it looks just like a LARPer's armor, I guess you might call it that. But the armor was impressively durable, in fact it can stop a cutting blow and a thrust very easily, even from a Roman gladius. Thing is though, a lot of Celtic warriors in Britannia during the time of the Iceni Uprising changed. I'll get that to later. But now, what about their arms and armor? Other parts of their, well, weaponry? Well, that's the thing. They would have actually used a type of, well, long swords, yes. But it, but here's the thing. In the lowlands of England, of Britannia, they were rich with iron ore and could afford longer swords. While the Celts in Northern Britannia or in Pitland or Caledonia or Scotland, as a lot of you always want to call it that, would actually use short swords because of not that much metal orgy. But as well, if you couldn't afford a sword, what you could go for it would be a spear, a knife. Now, Celtic spears in Britannia were different compared to the Celts of Iberia. Mainly because these weren't throwing spears, yet they could be thrown, but these type of spears were also used not as javelins, but as type of 2 meter long swords. Now you guys might ask yourselves, wait, what? Yes. The Celts of Britannia used a type of cutting motion by swinging around their head, kind of like the Germans. Which is actually how the Germans got their name, Gare, for Land of the Spearmen. But 
technically, in historical facts, Britannic Celts actually use this use the spear with their shield as a two meter long sword by thrusting instead of swinging it around. The only time they would swing it around is on one on one combat and pretty much if they were separated from their division. Now, the Celt of Britannia would still use a form of phalanx, kind of like the uh, Celts of Gaul or other Celtic tribes, but pretty much this type of Celtic phalanx was extremely light. And as well, their shields though, this was an impressive thing from the Celts of Gaul. The Celts of Iberia uh, had light shields and bucklers, while the Celts of Gaul had heavy heavy, well, pretty much uh, almost uh, Roman version shields, while the Celts of Britannia had a type of hexagonal and oval shields, in which were lighter and more durable. The reason why these things were actually extremely light was pretty much because they were made to be that way. In fact, they were also a little smaller, but that was the thing about them. But the thing is, they were sometimes even thicker and heavier, meaning you don't need a big giant giant shield to cover yourself when this thing can actually be lighter and as well it was also extremely harder to break. In fact even a Roman sword can't go through it, a club can't break it, it's impressive of how durable this shield was. In fact later on Roman legionnaires would copy from this design and use it for their own military groups of legionnaires that were inside Britain. But that's a different story. Now, let's go to the first invasion of Britannia, led by none other than Julius Caesar. Now, Julius Caesar was pretty much the most dumbest guy I think we ever know about, because technically, he stated he conquered the Britannians when he did not. In fact, he got defeated twice by taking Britannia. Yes, twice. This actually sounds weird, since he was the greatest Roman general in history and such. Here's the thing. He was not a great leader. When it came to invading Britannia, it stated that he lost hundreds of men. First time around, he fought against the Celts on the shores of Britannia. Yet, the Celts of Britannia ended up charging after them on the shores, and yet, the Romans then sailed a couple of miles down the coast just to get away from it, but the Celts still managed to get to them and cut them down instantly as soon as they came to shore. The Romans were brutally killed off. It was a massacre for the Romans. Now, you guys might also ask, how did they actually manage to charge after the Romans? Well, that's because the Celts of Britannia used chariots. Yeah, not just cavalry, but they also used chariots. The thing is, though, the Celts of Britannia had a different type of military form for chariots. Because, see, while many people use this as a form of uh, secondary archery position, the Celts used it as a transportation device, kind of like our modern-day military groups who use, uh, as a, who use transport vehicles to move troops. Except this would only move one troop every time, and rotate that troop every time. In fact, for example, state like this. Say I uh, pretty much drop off one of my soldiers in the front ranks, a heavy-duty combat warrior, a veteran berserker, I guess you might call him that, and lash him out at the Romans, in the process, this scares the living crap out of the Romans. And in doing so, another chariot comes around, dropping off one, and that guy gets, and the other guy I dropped before that gets back on. In doing so, I can also throw javelins, pelt them with slings, and even use archery on this. That was actually the cool thing about these. Think about the Celtic chariots that are impressively badass, was that they had a gyroscopic platform. Meaning, it doesn't matter how much the how much the terrain is bad, I can easily run, I can easily stay stable in this chariot while standing up, and yet I won't fall off, which is impressive. Which I'll leave a link down below for uh, Barbarian Tech from uh, Modern Marvels for you guys if you guys want to know more about that type of stuff. Now, also, let's go into other type of Celtic forms of armor. What did their helmets look like? Well, Celtic Britannic helmets weren't that much. In fact, the only type of versions we might see would be types that might have been stolen from the Romans. So, yeah. But as well, the Celts of Britannia did have one type of version that was actually quite simple for battlefield use. It almost looked like a Celtic 
uh, type of helmet, like a normal Celtic helmet, like technically like the earlier, like the late Roman Republic helmet, which if you get, or technically early Roman Republic or mid Roman Republic, whatever you want to put it as. Technically, what what it was though is that it was half that. It didn't have cheek guards. What it did look like though, if you technically looked at it a little closer, it almost looked like a baseball helmet. Yes, I know it sounds a little stupid now that I say it, but it did look like that. In fact, the only thing it did is actually have the type of neck guard right down here, and pretty much it pointed upwards like so. Pretty much you can make it out of brass or bronze most of the time, which the Celts did, instead of making it out of iron. In fact, iron helmets were kind of a rarity in Celtic Britain, so... But the thing is, when we think about the Celts normally, we normally think, oh, this guy's all wild. That's more of like the Celtic Britain. In fact, uh, if you guys have ever seen that Deadliest Warrior episode of the Celts... I Celts versus the Persian Immortal, well, they got a Celtic Britain in there, so, yeah, that explains it. But as well, the Celts did use clubs, like, known as the Bardiche, in which one hit from that can break a skull, so don't try it at home. But now, we also might wonder, wait, if the Celts were actually from, if the Celts of Britannia were using the well, Deadliest War episode, then that means that the Persian Warner might have lost if he went up to against a fully clad Celt. Pretty much. But now, let's get back to the history. Now, what happened after Julius Caesar's defeat? Well, here's the thing. Caesar wanted to go back, but in doing so, he had to wait after he invaded, defeated the Celts of Gaul, and soon after doing so, he ended up invading Britannia a second time. Only this time, he didn't meet any resistance on the shore. This was a trap. Set by none other than Casabades. Or Calivius, whatever way you want to pronounce him as. I, I can pronounce him Casabades if you ask me. Anyways, this was the same man who undermined Julius Caesar from when he actually invaded Britain. The first time. In fact, he was going to defeat him a second time. Except this time, using guerrilla warfare tactics. And as well, in the process, Roman general Julius Caesar actually did not realize that he was walking straight into a trap. The further inland he went, that's when Cassavellius actually cut off his supply route. And in doing so, he surrounded the Romans, cutting them down, massacring thousands of Rome, over hundreds of thousands of Romans, it's give or take, because the Roman accounts don't give a track record of how many were dead. But it's even stated that Julius Caesar stated that he conquered them and that he ended up defeating the Ro de defeating the Britannic people and ended up defeating the, one of their major strongholds. This was another trap. In fact, there was no one defending this major stronghold. In fact, this was on none other than Cassavellius' own hill fort. In doing so, he actually tricked Julius Caesar into attacking it. In doing so, all the supplies were taken from this fort, and as well, everything else. The entire empires were gone. There was nothing Julius Caesar can do. He was surrounded on all sides by Cassavellius' massive army. This terrified the Romans. In doing so, Julius Caesar was forced to flee back to Rome. But in doing so, he had to plea for, plead for his life. And he actually did so at the tip of a sword by none other than Cassavellius, who led his men from the front ranks. And instead of facing Julius Caesar, that was supposedly worn a red cape, just to mark himself out, here's the thing, this wasn't Julius Caesar, this was someone else, this was a stand-in, who died literally on the field of battle. As soon as the Romans saw this, they scared their living, they got really scared the living crap out of them, and in the process, were pretty much hacked to pieces. Now, though, a lot of Romans as well even heard the fact that this ended up, well, marking the end of Julius Caesar's massive campaigns, and would later on mark him as a failure forever, in which we can later on see in history when soon after he goes back to Rome, he's technically killed. But technically, this is before the uh, Roman Civil War, so you can see the point. 
But now, we also might wonder, wait, if Julius Caesar lost, then how did the Britannia become part of the Roman Empire? Well, that's the thing. Later on, it was none other than another type of Roman r emperor, and technically the one of the bloodline, well, supposed bloodlines of Julius Caesar, none other than Claudius, which is probably one of the greatest emperors of Rome, well, one of the few greatest emperors, who technically was right before Nero, which, yeah, we can already see where this is going to go. Yeah. But now you guys might wonder, well, what did Claudius do? Well, Claudius, in the process of invading Britain, ended up in a kind of accidentally going up against a type of new tribe. Now, this is, wasn't Casavelli's tribe, it was finally conquered by another Celtic tribe, in which there are a lot of versions of what they were. Now, some people say that this was a type of tribe known as the Kirkoganti or the Catoandi. Now, it's hard to say which one it was, and I kind of lost track of how many there were, but I will leave a link down below also for uh, Rome, Rise and Fall of an Empire that was used to be on the History Channel before it, before it turned stupid. Anyways, let's get to it. Now, we might wonder what actually happened. Well, the Celts at this point in time, seeing the Romans invading, and in doing so, what did they do? They used ambush tactics, hit-and-run tactics, causing the Romans to lose their grip. In fact, it nearly worked. hundred times over, the Romans were about to lose Britain. The thing is, though, the Romans then gave up. Now, that's actually the thing. In fact, it was only until the uh, Celtic commander, uh, which was known as Calamandunum, bleh, hang on, bleh, <clears throat> Sorry, it's hard to speak Celtic and ancient Britannic. Sorry. Anyways, technically, this one Celtic commander was captured, and technically king, and in the process was later on sent to Rome, where he actually told, spoke to none other than Claudius himself, and actually spoke a type of tongue in Celtic or Roman, we don't know and actually told him that if you kill me, then both our names will be silent. But, spare me, and your name will forever live. In doing so, Claudius spared his life. This was pretty much one of the most impressive things in history. But thing is though, a lot of Celts still fought back. In fact, the Druids fought back, and later on, another woman would rise up to glory. Boudicca. <laughs> now, let's get to Boudicca. Now, the reason why Boudicca was pretty much the most famous woman in history was actually kind of weird. Now, when we think of her, we think, oh, she fought against the Romans. Yeah, she kept on punching them. She kept on fighting. Thing is, though, she never did fight them first. First thing she did, she was actually an ally to the Romans. Seeing them come in, she actually welcomed them. The same with her husband. Thing is, though, upon her husband's death, eh, technically her husband died of natural causes, he ended up leaving half to his family and half to Rome. I think he should have left half the entire part to his to his family because my dear, this Romans don't like it. And that's also the same time when Claudius dies. When Claudius died, Nero came to power, and we all know how crazy Nero was. Kind of a loopy loop there. Anyways. What happened was, is the worst thing that Nero could ever do. He raised the taxes on the Celts, he forced the Celts to give up their weaponry, he forced massive, and I mean massive, taxations on everything. You couldn't pay up, you became a slave. In fact, later on, it's even stated that the Romans took everything from Boudicca. And in doing so, she lashed out at him, telling them that they can't do this. In doing so, they sent a message. One that ended up becoming the most dumbest thing they could have ever done. This Roman governor of Britannia did the most dumbest thing possible, and that was defile, have his army defile his own daughters, literally, have the army defile Boudicca's own daughters, and while they flogged her, right in front of everyone. 
Now, that's one thing you don't want to do. Especially to a woman who is technically a, what you might call, a, uh, well, a type of pagan priestess queen. Yes, this is actually what Celts did. They had queens that were kind of a form of priestess or whatever. But anyways, she was a close, well, friend to the Druids in which earlier the Romans actually slaughtered them in Wales. Preferably an island near Wales. This ended up marking the very end, nearly brought an end to Roman Britain itself. In doing so, Celts fought back and Boudicca rose up. In fact, the Celts of Britannia later on fought back and defeated Roman army after Roman army until finally they were defeated in one major battle. The Roman governor of Britannia fled back into Gaul, but later on was captured by one of Nero's ga Praetorian guards, and later on sent back to Britannia to actually be sentenced to a horrible form of mutilation in public. Ooh. But this wasn't a very quick mutilation. This was a whip mutilation. What do you mean by whip? Well... I mean literal, just regular leather, not the type of ones you might see that have, uh, you know, been hit, used on Jesus Nazareth. This was the type of one that would have been actually just used as a normal whip. And let's just say this thing tore into his flesh all over everywhere. But as well, you guys also might wonder what happened after Boudicca's death. Well, when Boudicca died, it stated that many of the Celts were slaughtered by the Roman commander, who in the process killed hundreds of thousands of Celts, in which even Nero himself said that this was a little too far. So he ended up actually making Boudicca a national hero, making a statue, making a grave marker, and actually made the Celts of Britannia feel more Roman than they were of foreigners in their own land. So, pretty much, I guess he did a good thing for once. Right? Anybody? Anybody at all? I don't know what I should say if he's a good guy now or not. But, yeah. But as well, if you guys probably don't know, when Boudicca did attack the Romans, she ended up slaughtering hundreds of them. Taking a hold of Roman areas such as London, or as back then it was known as the Londinium or Caledonium and such, and pretty much she ended up slaughtering a bunch of other villages and stuff and burned every temple of Rome to the ground. Now that is a liar. Uh, but yes. But yeah. But pretty much at that point in time, the Roman... Roman Britannia became more Romanized. In fact, it later on made Hadrian's Wall in the northern end of Britain. Which, by that point in time, was pretty much a... If you went north of Hadrian's Wall, it's pretty much a bad idea zone right there. Reason? The Picts. You go up there, you get slaughtered. Pretty much that's why the Celt of Britannia had to keep this wall. Thing is, though, that didn't happen. In fact, pretty much by the end of the Roman Empire, this is what happened. Rome was needing its army, and pretty much, guess who? Guess what they took with them? The Roman army took their entire army back to Rome. In doing so, leaving the island undefended. The only people that were defending it were actually national born, or actually people that were actually born there in Britannia. Now, that is kind of bad news there, because that wasn't that many military groups. And in doing so, they had to rethink everything. Well, later on, the Celts of Britannia invented the late Roman cataphract. In which, if you guys don't know anything about this, this is a type of, uh, I guess you might call it an early version of a knight. That's because of the look of it, but it's not a knight, so don't start going there. But let's just say, they these guys didn't even need a shield. They could actually just skewer a guy. <laughs> but as well, this was expensive. So, guess who they hired? That's right. The Saxons. They hired the Saxons, the Jutes, and the Angles to help them fight off against the Picts. In doing so, the Celts of Britannia actually had to owe them a lot of land for this. Kent was first, and then more and more. Later on, 
the Saxons ended up conquering most of Britannia. By that point, the, P the Celtic people were actually forced into a kingdom we now know today as Wales, which is a Saxon word meaning foreigner or stranger. This was actually the dead zone of the fallen end. This was the very late era of the Britannic people. By this point in time, the Britannic people were no more. Wales was now the kingdom of the Britannic people, and it forever will be. In fact, many people of Wales actually still say that they do have a right to be the rightful heirs to the Britannic throne. If that is or not, I'm not going to get into that. But the history of these guys is pretty impressive. And as well, I will be covering their arms and armor of the Welsh, the Celts, of the Welsh Celts, the Irish, and including the Picts or Caledonians, whatever you want to call them, in some other videos. If you guys like this video, let me know down in the comments below. If you also want me to talk about a type of group or such, also let me know down in the comments below and I will get right to it. Anyways guys, hopefully you found this helpful and have a good day.